us. What kind of knowledge are you dropping on us today? Today's knowledge bomb is about inflation. Did you know that poorly inflated tires can reduce your fuel economy by That's good. about you, you beat five me miles to the punch. per gallon? That's good. You beat me to the punch. I was going to ask, you mean like balloons? Yeah, no, I was actually looking it up. So I was trying to find out how much uh, pressure goes into your standard balloon, but then I didn't understand the measurement. Standard balloon. I don't know if there is a standard balloon. Well, your standard, ho- there is a standard home balloon that you fill up like those regular latex balloons. Okay. So there is a standard amount of pressure for those. I looked it up, but I didn't understand the measurements. It was mm. 33 mmHg. So I had to Google that out. Maybe we'll do a knowledge bomb about pressure and we should. physics at We're, some point. We've been very aggressive with the trending news lately but i don't think we need to be yeah but today's trending news is i mean it is related to that so it's inflation uh but the actual inflation that we're going to be talking about today is price inflation uh so that's pretty much just the idea that things get more expensive and how we measure that which is essentially what led to the great depression and recessions subsequent to that yeah i mean it's a pretty big thing that's been affected a lot of economies People may have heard the term hyperinflation as being really big in some South American countries. Right. Uh, It's just the idea about, you know, a single unit of currency. So whatever that is, we're going to be keeping our conversation mostly around the U.S. dollar. Right. And the idea behind inflation is, hey, how much can your dollar buy you? Right. Right. That's so that's actually let's just dive right in. So I just want to, you know, clarify. Um, So the danger with inflation getting too high is that economies can collapse. Dollars become worthless. You run into a situation like in Germany, what was it, pre World War One or pre World War Two, where people were literally burning money for heat because it was cheaper to do that than to buy fuel. Exactly. To actually burn it. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's a dangerous thing. It generally happens over time, um, but I guess the idea is to keep it in check, and at the very least, you know, in a in a well functioning economy, you want to keep incomes rising. Uh, commensurate to the cost of living. Yes. That's how you prevent runaway inflation. And by some people's thoughts, there is such a thing as healthy inflation. But we're going to get into that later. Okay. So the first Take thing, away. I think the big thing is what purchasing power is. Right? right. Because inflation at its root is measuring the change in your purchasing power. And so, just uh, another point I just want to clarify. Um, we're not talking in terms of credit. It's not a matter of running up debt to outpace inflation. We're talking about the purchasing power that your dollar gets you like what does the actual dollar you have today get you goods wise or service wise in exchange for that dollar as opposed to what it did yesterday and what it will tomorrow exactly so it's how much can a single dollar buy me right Right. so with inflation the dollar can buy you less so if a dollar used to buy you a gallon of let's just say water because we've got water in front of us and then that water or that dollar can now buy you half a gallon of water that means the purchasing power of your dollar went down, the right. inflation went up. Now, in some cases, there's something called deflation, which means that the purchasing power of your daughter, dollar went up, so you could actually buy more water for your dollar. So, in theory, on the surface, it sounds like deflation would be great, but I'm going to guess that's not the case. What are the dangers of deflation Oof. or runaway deflation? You know what? I'm going to ask you to save that question for later. Okay. Because with uh, as I was going through and setting up some notes here... I realize there's a lot of core information about what we're told about inflation, the way that it's measured, right. and a lot of stuff that I think will help us frame that conversation for our listeners okay. better later on. Okay. Uh, because I think the big thing is inflation, the way it's measured in the United States, is something called the Consumer Price Index. Right. Okay. Now, that is, we're going to call it the CPI throughout this conversation. So that's calculated by a government agency called the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We're not going to go into detail about who they are or anything. No, no, no. But they're a, you know, they're just a bunch of statisticians. Every single month, they gather data on about 8,000 items in 200 categories and across 38 geographical areas. So it's a lot. There's a bunch of different and kinds. And these are items rel- like necessary for everyday life. We're talking about eggs, milk, yeah. bread, gasoline, things exactly. like that. We're yeah. not talking about Xboxes. And- Actually, we are. Okay. We're talking about. Yeah. So there's those two th- within those 2,000 items, there's a lot of different things. There are things like rent. You have a breakout between cupcakes and regular cakes, right? That's one category. Another wow. category is cookies. Okay. 
So it gets into that level of detail in terms of the different items that are in there, right? So that's all of the items that they gather information about. It's I just want to, these, these are cookies across the board. They're not differentiating between, let's say, like Insomnia cookies and Chips Ahoy. Not to that degree. Not gotcha. to that degree. Okay. But they do, you know, there are some that things. That might be like, a distinction they want to look into. Yeah, but within apparel, they'll get in there about like men's suits, right? Like that went up by okay. 15%, I found out, right? Did women's suits go up the same? I have to check. Because that could be a good argument against the pink tax. <laughs> yeah, no. So prices change. They've got a lot of stuff. All of those things, they get individual prices for it. And they measure the change in those prices. Okay. Right? Now, when we're going to talk about the consumer price index, what they're doing at that point is they're aggregating all of those different price points, figuring out how much of your basket. So imagine a basket of things that the average American buys. It, we'll use your examples from before. It's milk, bread, and eggs. So they're saying that basket of milk, bre bread, and eggs cost $10 in March of 2000 or $100 in March of 2021, and then $108 in March of 2022. That means inflation went up by 8%. Okay. Right now, it's not just a basket of eggs; it's a bunch of different things. So, or a basket of eggs, milk, and breads. There's a lot of different things that are in there. So they, that includes things like rent. You have things like transportation, of course, gas. All of those things right. go into that consumer price index number. It changes every two years. There's some really cool stuff about how they decide which one they're using based on different things. But so, so just uh, so basically, a healthy number means that. More Americans can afford the necessities of life without struggle, more or less. I mean, obviously, there's different, you know, we can get into differentiators, whether a second part time job means you're struggling. But that's generally what's trying to measure, right? How what the average American can afford and how far away they are from not providing the necessities. They don't even go that far. They just compare the prices. Right. But I'm saying, OK. All right. right. So they'll say, OK. The average basket is now two, and they're just all about the percentage. What was okay. it, you know, a month ago or a year So then ago? how is that number used to determine the health of the economy or the health of the dollar? So the consumer price index is not really by itself. Right. I'm, I'm sure it's compared against it's something else. It's the change else, right? in it, right? Okay. That's the inflation. So if we say, you know, the way that it's used to affect the economy is, you know, you'll have things like social security. So right. how much is Social Security supposed to change? How much are things like, uh, you know, uh, government assistance pro government assistance programs? Who qualifies for them? Tax brackets. Those are all things that are calculated based on the consumer price index, right? Which gets again updated every month is what we we get data, but the basket of goods actually changes every two years. So interesting thing is there's a so they update the indicators. They update the indicators. So. How does this tie into the Big Mac price index? As we always hear about the Big Mac index, or you yeah. know, I know that's a, kind of a comic. It started off as like a parody thing, right? Yeah. Did, did so, you do any research on that? If not, it's okay. No, but, so okay. I mean, I I did study uh, economics in college, right? I was I, waiting to, well, to I work know that's that why in. You're that's a resident expert. So the Big Mac index isn't really about inflation. It is about purchasing power, but across currencies. Gotcha. So that's how much does a Big Mac cost in different countries? Right. Okay. Not how much, you know, a Big Mac. Well, I mean, you can also look at how much was a Big Mac two years ago and things like that. Right. But that's the whole idea behind it. Okay. So we'll bracket the Big Mac index for now. That could be a whole different oh, yeah. discussion topic. So, all right. So we yep. learned how it's calculated, right? Yep. Um, what it affects in the government. So yep. Social Security, um, income eligibility levels for government assistance. So that's a big one. Yep. Right. Um. Yes, and to automatically provide cola adjustments, cost of living adjustments yep. to millions of American workers. And just a quick callback to our previous episode number three about unions. Unions often use the consumer price index to negotiate increases in wages. Gotcha. And a lot of people, every single year when they get their raise, you should be. And by the way, listeners, if you're not comparing your annual raises to the rate of inflation, you should. Because if inflation, like this year, inflation went up by 8%. If you got a 3% raise, you guess it. You took a 5% cut. You took a 5% cut. So important pro-life tip from Knowledge Bombs. Um, that's actually a really good tip because a lot of people out there probably don't do that. Um, yep. So, all right. Okay. Argument take. Nice round numbers. Let's say, you know, um, let's say a person's making $100 a year yeah. and they qualify for government assistance. The... 
the inflation. They Let's say they, or they don't. don't. Okay, the inflation rate is eight percent. Right. So next year they're making one hundred and two dollars, but when you compare that for inflation, it should be one hundred and eight. Yes. But now that they're at one hundred and two, in theory, they should qualify eventually if they the will. government updates these things. Which you know we're we're not here to get into the bureaucracy and red tape of you know that type of stuff. But that's in a perfect system. That's how it would work, right? Yeah. That's the idea behind using these numbers for comparison. Exactly. Got yeah. Okay. The biggest flaw to it, honestly, is that there's just a little bit of a delay. So that is the way that it works. Well, yeah. I mean, you know. They, you can't analyze yeah. data before it happens. No, exactly. Right. So it happens, there's a delay, it comes in, and that's it. And that's part of the problem, too, which is what I wanted to talk about before. I got a little bit ahead of myself, is there's something called bracket creep, right? Okay. So the idea is your wages go up because of inflation, right, right. automatically. And then, you know, you get a raise, but you're actually moved into the next tax bracket, before uh, you're moved into that next tax bracket, before the tax code is updated to keep you in middle class, right? So you wind up paying taxes at a higher bracket just because your wages are there, but it's still not adjusted for Got what it. actual middle income is, middle All right. class income. So is. a p- important point of clarification, and we had this up here the whole time. Nice. Um, the uh, and we uh, we should do an episode at one point on how tax brackets actually work. Yeah. Before people start, you know, because a lot of people are under the assumption <laughs> that like. You know, oh, I made an extra two dollars this year, so I'm gonna pay more in taxes by earning the two dollars. Right. That never happens. The brackets mean you're getting tax on dollars earned within that range. Right. So, you know, like for instance, if you know you're making a hundred dollars a year and you get a raise to a dollar, a hundred and two dollars, and the tax bracket cutoff is the hundred and one dollar mark. You're not getting that new rate assessed at all of your income just on the two dollars above the hundred. Exactly. So you're not going to ever lose money. But what you're talking about is something different. That's more of you know uh, where you're going to be relative to where they feel like the middle class should take that right. tax. In. No, and actually where that second tax amount comes starts. Right. Right. So if you're getting taxed on those extra two dollars, if it's in a year where inflation gave you that raise, right? But you still don't have the purchasing power of someone in that next tax bracket. Getting taxed on an extra two dollars hurts you, right. right, or hurts the American people as a whole because these things may not seem like it's a big number on an individual person, but when you think about it on a larger scale, that's where it comes into play. Well, yeah, and then when you extrapolate it across the board, you know, you have higher instances of poverty. You know, uh, more homes with kids that can't get fed the right way. Uh, yeah. More people that lose jobs because they can't afford to fix their car. They don't have reliable transportation. Yeah. So on and so forth. A lot of things. I mean, they do happen here where we live, but, you know, this does hit poor areas of the country a lot worse. Absolutely. Um, Inflation in general does hurt lower income folks more because uh, oftentimes inflation is tied to gas prices. So this specific inflation that kind of spurred this episode, which was, you know, I think everybody probably heard in the news. Oh, inflation went up by 8%. Right. That was all over the news. It was the largest amount since like the 1980s. Right. Something the last 40 years. All that was was that the prices of March 2022 compared to March 2021. The CPI. Yes. The CPI from 2022 of March or March of 2022 to March of 2021 went up by 8 percent. Right. Okay. And so and a good chunk of that was actually gas prices, which went up something like, you know, I think about 70 percent. So there, and that that hurts lower income people because a larger amount of their spend is gas. Gotcha. Right. So um, that's interesting. So yeah. that number, even though it's a good indicator for us to take into consideration, the CPI, it could be skewed by one or two things. So it's not necessarily that things across the board are eight percent more expensive. You could have it's, one thing that really throws it out of whack. So that's important yeah. to remember. But for anyone who's interested in knowing, they can do their research on Google. They can find the table that lists all the categories yeah. and see, you know, yeah. what's what. Um, yeah. it, so it, that's is, pretty good. it is government information. It's freely available. While I was doing my research for this, I think I spent a couple hours just looking at all the different items. That's, that's the I've sacrifice the Haas makes so you people at home don't have to. Oh, I was talking about me nerding out. It wasn't really a sacrifice. Well, yeah. <laughs> no, but it's fun. But here's the here's something. So now that people understand inflation, I kind of want to point out a couple of things. So inflation by itself sounds really bad, right? Things are getting more expensive. And so that means, you know, my purchasing power is going down. But there are, you know, a few reasons that economists and the government in general do want a healthy amount of inflation, which is usually argued to be between two to two and a half percent. 
Okay. Right. So let's talk about some of the things that happen when you have inflation. So uh, items do get more expensive. So we've talked at length about that. But an interesting thing about inflation is that it's actually good for anyone with debt. Right. So if you're borrowing money, mm-hmm. inflation is good for you because if you owe a thousand dollars. Right. But your thousand that thousand dollars now has less purchasing power. So instead of thinking, OK, I'm giving up a thousand. We're going to go back to our example of water. Now, I'm paying back my mortgage with a thousand gallons of water. Right. Instead, you're really only paying back your mortgage with 500 gallons of water just because right. the dollar buys less. So your debt gets cheaper. Right. So that's theoretical. No, that's actual. No. Well, so I'm going to pose this. Let's say the inflation rate is 5% and your APR on that debt is 9%. Okay. You know what I mean? So so the debt without the common you know, practical aspects like interest and things like that would get cheaper, I'm assuming, right? So. Well, I mean, so banks aren't stupid. They right. do work inflation. That's why, you know, that's why the interest rate in the amount is there. Your principal does go Right. Up. But if you have a mortgage, and so oftentimes we're, what I'm talking about here are things like With a like fixed loans. rate mortgage, you're usually good. Exactly. Yeah. With a fixed rate mortgage, any loan, so a car payment, for example. Right. That anything that's a fixed amount, the same amount month over month, right. that's actually cheaper Got for it. you yes. in terms of purchasing Open power. Open-ended revolving credit, like a credit right. card, different story. That's you know yeah. personal finance episode separately. But, exactly. Okay. Um, and, and that's why a lot of economists and the federal government will talk a little. We're going to go into that in a quick moment. But that's why they say some inflation is good because it encourages borrowing. Right. Right. Because the more people borrow, that means they're more likely to build new houses. They're more likely to start new businesses, which in turn creates jobs and yada, yada, yada. Exactly. So what are what are some of the primary causes of inflation? Yeah. So you've got a few. I mean, there's really three big ones. So the first thing is going to be production costs. And so this is where kind of inflation leads to it. So we're talking raw materials, labor, transportation, all of that, things like that, whatever, whatever it, it costs to, to produce a widget. Right. So, you know, you can imagine, I think the simplest way to think about it is if gas prices go up, it costs more to get your carton of eggs from the farm to the store to your right. home causes the price of the eggs to go up. Not if you buy farm direct. No, yes, I'm true. Um, so, <laughs> no, okay. but that's no, but th- but that's that something, is a huge thing. Yeah, yeah. Th- that's something that's it there. So local items might be cheaper. Because of the rising cost of gas, right? right? And there are things that the BLS does take into account for the CPI, but we're not going to go down that route. Yeah, all. that's that's too deep. Maybe later. Um, um, but that is, but that's it. And then also another thing that causes it is increased demand. Okay. Right. So just there's a larger population. There's more people competing for the same thing. Sometimes things like rent and you know in a specific town there's less space. So that would be increased demand against static or decreasing supply. Yes. Because if supply increases at the same rate of demand. And that really wouldn't lead to that really wouldn't be a trigger for inflation. No. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's important. To, I just yeah. want to highlight that. Like when demand outpaces supply, right. okay. the more people that want to buy something, the more expensive it's going to be. Right. That's, In the face of a non increasing supply. Yes. Right. Exactly. That's why I would, because right. if we just say increased demand, I don't want right. people to think like, you know, oh, more right. people need houses. So automatically there's inflation. No, more people need houses and there's not enough houses to be had. That's what's going to cause inflation. Beautiful. But if 100 new people a year need a house and 100 new houses a year are being built, we shouldn't really yep. see inflation because of that. Exactly. Okay. And that's great. And then the last way is, you know, we're going to call it fiscal policy. But the best way to think about that is just how much money exists. Right. So just how many dollars are available for everyone to spend. Right. That's all it is. Because if there's more dollars, if you automatically double. So the, we're talking total dollars in the economy. Total dollars in the economy. Right. And just how much money is there to spend. And so and that's where and we you know, we're going to have to do a whole thing about the Federal Reserve because right. that is a very complicated part of the government. But essentially think of but it. But we'll this, make it non-complicated. We're going sim- to simplify it for everybody. Yeah. Right. So the big thing about the Federal Reserve is they have the ability to add more money to the economy. Right. Which in th- which increases the amount of dollars, which does cause right. inflation. So a little asterisk, I just want to put there while you're mentioning that point, because a lot of people, this may come up and there's a lot of misinformation about this still. And the idea here is so people could be better armed in conversations. The Federal Reserve didn't always have that ability because we used to be on what's called the gold standard, right? Mm-hmm. Which means they used to have to have a set, like an equivalent amount of gold. At one point it was silver, whatever it was. It was Our money was backed by something. Yes. So they couldn't just produce money. It had to be, you know, they would release it in dribs and drabs but they could only produce money to the extent that they had the equivalent value of whatever precious metal our economy was backed by in the reserves yes 
but we went to a fiat system, which is basically imaginary. Like, you know, I, I know it's not quite as simple as that, but, you know, I mean, the only reason a $5 bill is worth a $5 bill is because we all agree not to question it, yes. right? It used to be worth a $5 bill because it would get you that much in gold, guaranteed, right? right? So, you know, um, so that's an important distinction to make because that's probably going to come up in people's conversations and, you know, and, and that's something that I think gave the government more control to, and I don't mean this in a bad conspiratorial way, manipulate the economy a bit when needed, right? No, I mean, that's exactly what they do, right? And it's not and it's not a conspiratorial way. I think it's just a very simple way that it gives the government the ability to, you know, control the money supply in the country. So how much right. money is available? And so, like, what they do, so the, if everybody thinks back to the pandemic, right, at the start of the pandemic, everybody was really worried about the economy, right? Everything's going to slow down. Everyone's staying at home. What the federal government did and is they reduced the interest rate for banks to borrow from the federal government. Okay. Now, the way that loans work for the most part is the big, the big banks, there's only a few of them, like private companies, not the gov general, uh, the federal government. Right. They borrow money from the federal government at an interest rate and then lend that money out to the public okay. for a mortgage. Okay. Right. So at the st before the pandemic, it was at one point five nine percent. That's the that's the rate that they borrow money from the federal government at. Okay. Then that went down. What the federal government did was they dropped that down to 0.1%, which meant banks could borrow money from the government cheaper to lend out to everyone else. Okay. So, right. That's when people hear prime plus whatever on mortgage rates and stuff like that. So if the prime rate is 1.59 and it's prime plus one, they're getting 2.59. But more often than not, that's going to vary based on when the Fed updates the rate, right? Oh, you're t at the point of the loan, right? It no, doesn't change well, throughout the life of the loan. Uh, okay. All right. I, I, didn't, right. I didn't know that. Well, there right. are some that do adjustable rates. Those are variable rate mortgages. That's right. a different. Right, right. No, no. This is. So the way that it happens is think of it like the bank is buying money. Right. No, right? exactly. They're buying so, it at 1%. They're reselling it or lending right. it at 2%. Right. Right. So the, the idea that. Okay. Yeah. It's like a bank for the banks. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so when there's the money's cheaper for the banks, they will. More people will borrow money. And they can lend out more, which means things like houses are more houses are being built and bought, more businesses right. are being started, or businesses can expand. Now, in theory, and which, that causes inflation. So, in theory, what should happen when the money becomes cheaper for the banks, it should become cheaper for the individuals, and also credit restrictions should open up, right? Credit standards should become a little more laxed. The idea is to get the idea behind it is to get more money into the hands of more people. Exactly. For different purposes, whether it's small business loans, mortgages, you know, home refinances, education funding, whatever it is. Now, that's that's the in theory, that's what it should do. There's a lot of other things. I don't want to mislead people say, oh, that's automatically, you know, A is automatically going to lead to B. There's a lot of other things that do get in the way in our bureaucracy. But we're just focusing right now on, you know, the the levers that are used specifically for inflation, stuff like yeah, that. Absolutely. And that's it now. And that's why some people say it's a good thing to have that 2% inflation because more money gets borrowed. Right. Again, more stuff happens. So let's talk about a couple of other things that are tied to inflation that, you know, without trying to get too heavy into opinions and it's a bit political yeah. minimum wage. One thing we always hear about when people talk about minimum wage is how it hasn't kept up with the rate of inflation. And that's why it needs to be adjusted. One of the big problems we're facing now is because it was neglected for so long, it's we're making such a big jump right now that it is gonna it, it probably will hit certain businesses and stuff like that, but we can't just not adjust it, right? So um, you know, in nineteen I'm just looking at the notes here, in nineteen sixty eight, minimum wage had the most purchasing power, which I believe is also the year it was created, right? The the minimum wage, the federal minimum wage. So that makes sense because we've had consistent inflation since the wage has not gone up. Yes. So a stagnant wage against increasing inflation has decreasing buying power. That's yes. a very good summary of our, one of the main takeaways. Um, and if it had kept up with inflation at this point, now this is the federal minimum wage, different States will vary, but it should be about $26 today. Meaning what you could buy in 1968 for i believe two dollars and change whatever the first minimum wage was when it came into play yeah. right it would cost you 26 dollars today to buy that same thing exactly but the federal minimum wage is nowhere near that so 
that's that that's a, that's a big thing that that's yeah. why it comes into play in that conversation all the time yeah. um but uh, on the other side a drastic increase in minimum wage might cause inflation right exactly. so um i just make sure i'm reading this right if the minimum wage goes up by 10 percent and inflation goes up by five everyone is still better off got yeah. that but so i think that's one of the arguments we hear around the minimum wage increases that are being debated now because you have people on one side of the argument are like well this hasn't kept up forever it's it's leading to increased poverty increased reliance on social programs we need to catch up and the other side whether or not they agree there should be a higher social uh, minimum wage they're kind of like well there's also a danger to doing it so much so quickly so yeah. you know it's kind of like that's the dilemma with that and i'm not posing this question i'm just saying yeah. oh, the big dilemma is well what do we do right do we right. continue to kick the can down the road and make the gap worse and worse and worse and kind of right this wrong right because you know i think it's kind of hard to argue with the fact that the decreasing power of the minimum wage has led to one of the things that led to the position we're now financially yeah i mean it, it absolutely does, right? Because if, you know, the federal minimum wage being as low as it is, right? And let's just take a step back and not even think as far back as 1968, right? Right. Let's just think about the last year, right? So someone's getting paid minimum wage. Everything is more expensive by 8% since March of last year. So you start a brand new job last year. You were getting paid the minimum wage. Now you can buy 8% fewer goods and services with the Widgets. same amount of money you're making. Right. Right. And that just by itself fundamentally just means that person is 8% poorer if they're buying gas. They can buy 8% or actually technically 70% fewer gas with the same amount of dollars right. they're making. And one of the our arguments you hear around this a lot is how corporations are making the some of the biggest profits they made in years. Exactly. While you know people aren't getting raises especially in this last year on average that have kept up with inflation so that's an important thing right because um, their prices can make will it go will. up right, right. Their prices will go up right, right. we've seen well, that, that well that's what causes that's inflation what, so their the prices, prices are, going up. Are, but, but the wages aren't going up so their cost or the the cost associated right. with the labor doesn't go up right exactly so that's how they're able to beat it which you know yeah. make it that what you will um so inflation no not you the listeners uh, so oh, no. <laughs> inflation is potentially good for borrowers in the right context because you're paying your loan with money that's now less valuable so yep. and that's actually that might be another interesting episode the way the super rich leverage debt that oh, average yeah. people don't um yep. so um and this yep. in turn makes people more likely to borrow which is good because it opens up things like housing markets yeah. small businesses i mean in education theory, i mean yeah. that's why the housing market is in right such a well a lot of this because, is theoretical a lot right. of economics is theoretical you know because it all depends on the right and proper policies being implemented right. and a lot of these conversations just to you know kind of clarify this for people at home a lot of these conversations rely on people making policy absent other you know um you know, absent other biases, right? Yeah. So you do have, and this is what happens with politicians, they have to pander to their base. They have to serve the, the interests of their community and things like that. And, you know, so that's where you get into, they're not making these economic decisions in a vacuum, right? Yeah. Which, you know, is good and bad from an yeah. economic, from a strict economic perspective, yeah. it's bad because they ha they're considering things that aren't quote unquote relevant to the data, but that's a whole nother uh, argument. Yeah. Um, so some inflation is necessary to encourage economic growth. Um, yeah. That's, I think, you know, you did a pretty good job taking us down that path. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's pretty much it. I mean, you want to understand what is inflation, right? Right. What's inflation is the so big thing. Let's summarize. How let, let's summarize this quick one sentence what is inflation well i mean you could do two sentences if you want but i'm just saying like clear, clear concise you know things getting more expensive all right um how can it be good it makes people more likely to borrow and spend borrowed money okay and we're not talking about borrowing on a credit card just to go have fun we're talking about borrowing for things that contribute i mean not that credit Start card spending doesn't affect the economy in a positive way but Right. Start businesses, and expand homes, businesses, homes, anything. renovate buildings, yeah. things like that. Okay. How is it bad? Things are more expensive. People aren't getting wages fast enough, so people are technically poor. And what happens when we don't get it in check? Oh, the d dollar or whatever unit of currency you're using becomes useless. Boom. Knowledge dropped. Let's go. <laughs>